Thank you for your interest in the special audio recording of a Teach 2016 workshop. This audio file is a free resource from USA, Canada, Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries, Regional Office. Recorded at 2016 Teach Conference, held at Springdale Church of Nazarene in Cincinnati, Ohio. We extend appreciation to the presenter who gave permission for the recording to be distributed as a training resource, and pray that it will be a blessing to your ministry. If you have any comments about the content or quality of this recording, please send them to stmi.nazarene.org or call 1-877-240-2417. This is Justin Pickard with Teaching That Connects With Youth. Well, again, uh, welcome. I trust that you are having a good time already, as you kind of heard from, from Albert Hung this morning. We had a great time of worship. Uh, last night was really great. I, I actually flew on the plane with Dr. Graves yesterday here from Kansas City. Um, I'm at the Global Ministry Center in the USA-Canada Regional Office and uh, coordinate NYI for the region. My name is Justin Pickard, and I've been doing that for a couple years now. Was brought in to kind of uh, relaunch a regional NYI office in the USA Canada uh, regional office. And so excited to be here with you. Didn't really know what to expect when I talked with Larry about uh, the Teach Conference, and he asked me to come and be a part. I was really excited to be here, but didn't know what to expect. But this is a, a really great group, so I appreciate you being here. And we're going to talk a little bit about something that is really foundational, um, and, and I'm just curious because for some of you this may seem like, um, you know, basic, simple kind of youth ministry 101 kinds of things, but I think for me, I have to constantly be reminded of just basic, simple reminder kind of things, and I hope that you'll get something out of this, even if it's uh, maybe some things to take back home and talk with other youth leaders that you work with. But I'd like to to just start by asking um, a couple things, questions of you. How many of you, um, you've been at this youth ministry thing or teaching students, I'm gonna use the words students and youth kind of interchangeably today. How many of you have been working with students um, for more than 10 years in some capacity? All right, great, some of the great veterans, awesome. How many of you um, like five to 10 years, something like that? Okay, handful. And uh, anybody that's really brand new in just the last year or two, you're just kind of really new to the game, and okay, great, that helps me to kind of get a gauge for, for where we're at. Well, if you have the outline here, um, I, I want to kind of help us to, to unpack and think a little bit together about what teaching specifically that connects with youth looks like. And I think there's a lot of things about this that are applicable to, to every age group and that sort of thing, but we're youth leaders, and so I want to kind of specifically talk about some things that I think hit teens in particular, students, youth, again, kind of using those words interchangeably. So I want to do a quick little word association. And so I want you, you're kind of set up in tables here. This works out really, really well, I think. So I want you to kind of see your table as kind of a little team, a small group. And I'm going to write a word on the board. And as soon as I do, I want to just hear kind of your initial reactions. What are the words that come to mind? What are the thoughts that come to mind? Just kind of turn into your table, your, your folks there, and just share what are the first things that bubble up in your mind when you see this word. All right? Hopefully you can read that over there. All right, you're at the Teach Conference, so no surprise here, right, what we're talking about. So just turn to your, turn to your neighbors. What comes to mind? Word association, just real quick, share with them. What are the words, the pictures, the thoughts? <laughs> okay, so let's hear a couple from from your tables. What did you think about? What did you come up with? What did you say? Teach, teacher, what's that? Learning. Sharing wisdom. Planning. Retention. Retention. Instruction. 
I love it that a lot of these words are like positive things, right? Sometimes, uh, at least for me in youth ministry, um, you know, bored, sleeping, nap time, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that seem rise to the top. But this is what we want to talk about just a little bit um, here today. And I'm going to try to kind of keep us on pace so that we can finish well and maybe even get to some of these kind of struggle pieces that uh, that some of you are, are mentioning on your cards. But I want to suggest something to you here that maybe you've heard before. Again, this may not be certain, you know, new information for you, but a great reminder. But we're going to unpack this a little bit as we walk through it together. And this is the idea that that formation is the next step on the same path. Transformation is the next step on a new path. Let that sink in for, for just a second. Formation is the next step on the same path. Transformation is the next step on a new path. You know, um, Dr. Graves said some things that, that I really resonated with that kind of fit with what I'm talking about here today and something I'm doing later in session three with meditation. Albert Hung kind of alluded to some of this um, this morning. And so it just reminds me that uh, that, again, this isn't something terribly new, but it's so, so foundational, so important for us to understand as we're teaching and working with youth. But you know that we're not called to transform students. That's not our job. That's not our role. That's not um, what we're even able to do. Albert talked about it in terms of we, we can't cause growth, right? So we're not, we're not called. That God doesn't expect for us to transform students. That's his job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But as Albert suggested, we do have a role to play, right? And our role, we're called to disciple them, to encourage them, to help them take the next steps to foster spiritual formation, the next step on the same path. God brings the transformation, but then he puts people like us in others' lives to disciple, to walk with them, to help lead them in the next steps on that spiritual formation journey. So that's what I want us to talk a little bit about today. And I don't want to just talk at you or just talk to you. So we're going to talk a little bit together. You're going to talk with your tables just a little bit. And that's what I want to do right now. So again, we kind of have broken the ice a little bit with your table groups, but I want you to take just a couple of minutes to turn to the people at your table and ask this question or answer this question briefly. And I realize this could go really deep in a lot of different ways and, and all of that, but I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. And I'd love for you to dialogue with the people that you're seated, sitting next to. Is discipleship caught or taught? I'm not going to give any more thoughts there. I just want you to open that conversation with the people next to you just a second. How do you answer that? Is discipleship caught or taught? Okay, so I, I heard somebody suggest it's a trick question. It's not really a trick question. <laughs> but like many good questions, right, there's not just a simple, pat, little, static answer. And that's what I'm trying to do. Even in, in what we're doing today, how I'm kind of leading, I'm hoping that you're kind of picking up on some just little um, teaching elements, some things that hopefully will help you. And one of the things I've found with students is 
when we learn to ask the right questions that involve them and create dialogue space, uh, that's really critical with students. And, and we're going to kind of walk through that a little bit. Um, we don't, I, I'm going to kind of move past, normally I would kind of get a little bit of feedback from you on what you said and that kind of thing, but um, I heard some good things. But the reality is uh, the answer, at least in my mind, is both. Right? It has to be both. It's not one or the other. It's not an either or proposition. It's a both and. It, it's both. You remember show and tell, um, like in kindergarten or whatever, right? Um, we all know that the, the genius behind that was that it was, you know, interactive, but it wasn't just talking about it. It was kind of showing something. There was, there was both the show and the tell. And I think in discipleship, especially with teens, but I would say with adults as well, that we have to be about show and tell. Uh, we have to be about, as Albert kind of talked about, right, um, there's the instruction, kind of the information transmission and those kinds of things, but then there's the taking the next step together in community, the discipleship, the walking the journey together, the small group interaction, the what I kind of, you know, consider caught, this idea that, um, you know, as I read through scripture and look at... Um, some of the things and the ways that Jesus taught his disciples, um, oftentimes it wasn't the, the words, <laughs> it was the, um, the lack of words or the silence or the just modeling for them. And with students, we have to find those little aha moments mm -hmm. in the midst of camp or road trip or all those kinds of things, right? I'll give you a quick example. Uh, my one of my youth pastors growing up was a was a great communicator, but he was doing this series on anger, and I was a, a young angry teenager. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's the red hair or what, but um, <laughs> so maybe he was speaking directly to me. But you know, I wasn't getting it. I really wasn't getting it. And uh, and then we were playing basketball one day before youth group was about to start, and uh, I swiped the at the ball and I knocked his watch off, and it hit the ground, broke. And he just literally picked it up, and he's like, nothing but a thing, threw it aside, checked the ball into me, and all of a sudden it hit me. Like he's modeling what he's been talking about, about becoming slow, you know, to become angry. And um, he didn't really say any words other than nothing but a thing, threw it aside. But it was, I caught something about his spirit and his attitude toward me, and uh, it was huge. Students are watching us, and they're picking up on all the nuances of our attitude, um, how we approach things. We can speak all day long about um, loving God, but when we're in a tough situation, they're watching how we deal with people. What's our attitude? Um, how do we approach situations? How do we deal with stress? Um, you know, the fact that we're not swearing as we change the church van tire for the third time on a road trip, <laughs> um, that's a big thing. But so it's got to be both, though, right? It's got to be both caught and taught. We do need to use language, but we also need to model. So I want to just share with you four quick points that I think help us understand that it's got to be both. Um, but I, I want to help us gain a broader understanding of this, of teaching, because it's not, again, just, as Albert said, information transmission. We are called to, through prayer, ask God to bring about transformation in the lives of our students and, and how do we connect with them to, uh, to be a part of this process of transformation in their lives. So the first thing I want to just say is it takes heart. Uh, heart for two things. Heart for God and a heart for students. Um, you know, it's like we live in the tension of these two worlds in youth ministry and really in any, any ministry, right? But we have to know the word well, we have to know God well. We can't teach and, and model for students anything that we don't understand and know and uh, live out, flesh out ourselves. So we have to know God and his word personally, but we've also got to know students. Um, the truth of the matter is we can't teach the Bible anything. That's not our role. Uh, the Bible informs us, teaches us, trains us, but we can teach and train students. And so when we recognize that our job isn't to teach the scripture, but it's to teach students the scripture, that's, a, that's an important distinction, I think, to make. So we have to have a heart for the word, for the Lord, but also for students. And so we kind of live in, these two, in between these two worlds. And um, it's important for us to understand both. We don't have to understand them perfectly. 
Um, I don't know everything about Scripture. There's a lot of things I don't know about Scripture. And I don't know everything about connecting with every student. But I work hard at both ends of the spectrum to really know God personally and His Word and also understand students and connect with them so that I can bring these two worlds together. And that's a big part of what we're doing when we're connecting with youth in youth ministry is bridging these two worlds together. Secondly, um, teaching students the Bible. This is kind of what I just alluded to, that we can't teach the Bible anything, but we're teaching students the Bible. So we have to know both students and the Word well. And so what does that mean? It means time spent. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, spending quality time with people. But again, Albert said something I was going to say here today. I think in today's world, quality time with students is important, but quantity time is huge. Um, <laughs> I've even dubbed it sometimes just literally wasting time with students. Just hanging out. Just chilling. And, and I get it. When, uh, when we're super busy, maybe you have other jobs and roles. We have families. We don't have a whole lot of time. Time's really important to us. But I think that's why, too, just spending time with students communicates so much about our desire to connect with them because they realize we don't have a lot. This is a commodity that's really valuable, and I'm willing to just hang out with you, play some video games, go to the store, whatever. I tried when, uh, when I was doing full-time youth ministry at a local church, um, I, never, I tried to never do anything by myself. So even when I was just going to the grocery store, preparing for a big trip or um, anything, I tried to pull in teens to just help me, walk with me, um, spend some time together. And it was amazing how many of them said, you know, that trip to Costco was one of my favorite things that we used to do before every big trip, you know, just things like that, just wasting time together. So there is a big part that's caught besides just taught. And that goes to point number three. Relational capacity is critical. Sorry, I'm missing the stuff here. So teach students the Bible. And then relational capacity is critical. Y you've heard it said before that, you know, they don't really care what we have to say until they know how much we care. And it's so, so true. Um, I, I believe in youth ministry that it really takes a couple of years to even break down the walls that students have built around their hearts and their relationships with adults, but it's critical that we continue to chip away at that wall, and it means, again, quality and quantity time spent. Fortunately today, I think that we have the opportunity to uh, connect with students um, kind of all the time, and some people uh, suggest, and there's certainly a slippery slope with social media, but I think when it's done well, we have an opportunity to connect with students um, all the time or for them to connect with us and we we need to set boundaries and I get all that that's really important but the fact that uh, that we can connect with them and we don't have to always be sitting face to face knee to knee shoulder to shoulder um, just gives us I think some opportunity to continue to connect and build relationships even outside of the what one or two hours a week that we get to spend with them you know it <laughs> it hit me not long ago that <laughs> I have hoped that students' lives would be transformed um, by my teaching and modeling and, and time spent with them an hour or two a week. And when I read scripture and realize that it took three years for Jesus' perfection <laughs> to really mold and shape his disciples, and he was with them all day, every day, I realized that my two hours extrapolated over six or seven years really amounted to a drop in the bucket when it comes to opportunity for building relational capacity and yet it's really critical. Um, most of you would say that you can't remember a particular sermon or a message that changed your life but you can remember the people and the time that they invested, how they walked along with you and helped you in that spiritual formation. Relational capacity is really critical and if we're going to gain an ear with our students it's first got to come by just spending time together. Um, and then lastly, um, we don't bring the growth, but we do till the soil, plant the seeds, water. Again, going back to kind of what Albert alluded to this morning. And I don't know about you, but for me, that takes the pressure off. <laughs> like my, my job is not to fix kids. 
your job is not to transform anybody. You can't do it. So it takes the pressure off in my mind. But our job is to come alongside, to, to guide them, to lead them, to take the next steps with them, to build relationships and point them to Christ um, in everything that we do. So it's really critical to understand what our role is in the process, but it also drives me to my knees, right? And praying for my students and for my ability to, uh, to be a part of what God is already doing in their life. So in one sense, I'm off the hook, but on the other sense, it's a great responsibility that, that I take the opportunity to pray and to say, God, all I can do is all I can do. I'm giving it all I can, but I'm trusting you to take these seeds that are planted and this little bit of water that I'm offering and the, the, the soil that I'm trying to till and all those things to really bring about the growth. And I love the example that Albert shared with the bamboo. I hadn't heard that before. I've, I've done some research and things about redwoods, and you understand their root system is all connected, and so they're literally holding each other up. That's part of the greatness of redwoods. But I love this imagery with the bamboo, right? Because how many of us have been with that kid or in that ministry where it's months, maybe years, and it's like nothing, like nothing, not even just a little seed you know, popping up out, nothing. And then all of a sudden, at this event, or this crisis experience or whatever and boom it just starts to to shoot up so remembering our role in it I think is really really critical well I want to turn real practical here and um, we're going to try to kind of move in a bit of a practical direction but I want to have you turn back into your groups here and and brainstorm thinking through some of this more kind of theoretical uh, kind of stuff but I want you to turn more practical and take just a moment to brainstorm with your group. If this stuff is true and we're, we're trying to connect with students, what does that look like in um, terms of methods of teaching? What are some specific examples that you think help to connect with students when it comes to teaching, recognizing that it's both taught and caught, right? So what do our Sunday school classes need to look like? What do our Wednesday night, what do our small groups interactions need to look like? How do we infuse teaching into everything that we do with students? Our one hour a week or our you know, new programs and things? What do you think it looks like? How do we, what are some methods, some real practical methods that you've seen that have worked when it comes to engaging students, keeping in mind these things that we've kind of already um, talked about? All right, so clump up again, just take a, a about 90 seconds. What are some of the methods that you could brainstorm besides just the old lecture format, like I'm giving you the last 10 minutes? How do we help engage students and connect with them through teaching? Okay, go. Oh, like, I think it's a little bit better than the first one on the last video. 
Okay, so what are some uh, some quick hit things that, that you've heard? What are some modes and methods for connecting with students through kind of teaching elements? What's working for you? We're not looking for the big story. Just give us the word or phrase that captures how you do that. Well, you guys were just, man, it was like chattering, and then all of a sudden, nothing. So. Okay. Right. So what, what were some of the things that were brought up? What were some modes or methods for teaching that really helped connect with students so you're not just talking at them, but... Um, Conversational approach. Okay. Yep. Discussion questions. Yeah. Small groups and discussion. We talked about the questions. Good. You said you know the Bible and know your students, but I think it's so important to also know the world that they live in yeah. and the things that they do, because it's totally different than, you know, like, I went out with a teenager, we did this, this, but it's totally different for them now. That's part of knowing students, and so here's the big key, right? Lean in. This is really important, right? It means we have to listen to them. <laughs> um, and we're pretty good at talking to them, but we've got to listen. Yeah, let them shape uh, the lessons. Ask them to teach and to lead from time to time. Um, good. What else? I think getting parent input sometimes is good too. Sure. I have a parent that's struggling at home with a specific mm -hmm. thing, and so knowing what they're struggling with at home, so yep. that way you can hear a lesson. Yep. Again, listening. Help them. Yeah, and listening to parents. I like to get with teachers and ask them what's going on in the classroom and what are you hearing and, and learning. And Yeah, what else? Um, use your youth that were raised in the church hmm. to mentor hmm. those who are not. Yeah, and you know what? I often, uh, I kept my group together, junior high and senior high, but we did things to kind of separate them out for developmental kinds of reasons and different things. But... Uh, I leaned on my older kids to help disciple the younger kids. And then even the younger kids helped in our children's ministry, discipling and whatnot. So uh, absolutely right. I mean, one of the best things um, Albert alluded to, kind of pushing people out of their nest, out of their comfort zone. And I don't know about you, but I learn best when I am having to teach <laughs> others or show them the way. There's some responsibility there. So asking and expecting our students to lead that way. So, yes. Oh, one of my favorites, right? We all love a good um, field trip. You remember in school, like, field trip was where it was at, right? It was yeah. like, why don't we do field trips every day, and then every once in a while meet in the classroom. And do, you know. But uh, we talk about it as fun, but do you remember some of the life lessons that you learned on field trips or when you were out and about? Those things are so important, and so you're right. Um, and I think that goes, again, back to Jesus' model, the, the rabbinical model of teaching that he gave, um, it wasn't at all the time just sit down and kind of listen to me talk, but there were teaching moments at every turn, right? And you know what? We, if we're not intentional about it, about getting out, I think we miss all those moments and opportunities. So it's kind of what I want to get to here for this last um, practical bit, and that is really how can we think creatively about connecting with students in these kind of teaching moments? And... Um, you know, even our rooms, even the room setup can show your teens that this isn't going to just be the same old thing, right? Um, I didn't know what the room was going to look like in here, so I had imagined already in my mind having set up in kind of little half circles of chairs where you could interact with your group 
discussion. You notice how I've kind of bounced back and forth between kind of information and then dialogue between yourselves and with us. I think that interaction, that engagement is so critical for students. Um, I think it is for adults too. We know that there are a million different learning styles, right? So we can't just aim at one. We've got to kind of work through a series of different possibilities. So everything counts when it comes to um, how we're teaching and the modes and the methods. So I would say that there's not a whole lot of right or wrong answers here. It's the matter of are we, is there some variety? Are we doing what meets the needs of our students in terms of engaging them? And Dr. Leonard Sweet has uh, some really good things, I think, to say. One of my favorite kind of practical modern-day theologians um, has some really good stuff. Now, when I heard him share this, he was applying it to worship, but I think it's very, very applicable to teaching students. And so he talks a lot about how this generation um, is kind of an epic generation. And epic, they love the word epic. I have a 13-year-old. I work with my youth ministry at church. Um, even in my role of overseeing youth ministry in USA and Canada, I felt it really, really critical for me to practice what I'm preaching and actually connect with students. <laughs> so every Sunday night I meet with about 12 7th and 8th grade boys um, for a discipleship group. And it really, quite honestly, helps keep me sane. Um, but I love it. Uh, I love spending that time with those, with those boys. But I've seen what he's saying here is really critical about that they're an epic generation and if we apply what he's saying to students and how we're teaching them it's been really helpful for me so I want to kind of outline this um, this phrase or what he's suggesting here the E standing for experiential we've got to make it experiential our kids think about their lives these days and what they how they live them um, you know they're not looking for a a sage on the stage, <laughs> right? Um, somebody just lecturing to them, at them. They're really looking for somebody to come alongside them to guide them through their experiences in life. And I think when we can create environments or experiences, one of them <coughs> mentioned getting out of the church a little bit, um, I've, just, I've just found that that's some of the most fertile opportunity for teaching moments is when we take our kids through experiences. So... Uh, I know sometimes service projects and trips and things like that, there can be some negative connotation there. We need to do those well. We don't need to just drop in and do ministry things, not recognizing the context that, in which those people live. But there's so much good that happens when we just get out and do life together and serve together and share together and sometimes even butt heads together, right? There's something about close proximity with those road trips and camps and things that both bring the greatest kind of discomfort and kind of, you know, um, grading on each other, but also some of the best growth and connection points and memories and things like that, right? So we got to find ways in our teaching to be experiential with students. Um, then the P, Leonard says, participatory. We've got to engage them in the process. And so I love what a couple of you have suggested. What does it look like when we even let the students teach? When we let them come up with some of the plans. When we work with them and coach them along in leading others, we allow them to participate. Think about their lives. Think about the culture today. Um, even some of the shows and things that, that are on TV. Students today, they don't know how to engage something if they don't have input in it. If they don't get to vote on who's winning, if they don't get to engage it through social media, they're, they're not interested. They want to engage. They want to connect. They want to be a part of the process. They want to participate in the outcome, right? So we have to find ways to let them into, from the very beginning, into the discussion, into the planning, into the process, into the growth, um, into the creative ideation. And so I think that's critical for us as, as teachers. And then uh, I, image rich. Um, Content is still important in our day, but more than ever, images, graphics, videos, media um, are a huge part of that content. And you can have the, you know, the best content in the world, but if students don't feel it, if they don't engage with it visually, um, we miss a huge opportunity. And so I think that's why you hear, or I hear my 13-year-old daughter talk about how she kind of lives on YouTube and I don't know that a day goes by that she's not showing me some goofy video or you know whatever 
They are so media saturated. And I do believe there are times that we need to help our students unplug from media and fast. That's really critical. But I also, I'm just as passionate to say that I don't think that we need to um, run away and hide our heads in the sand from media as a, as a tool for positive discipleship. Um, when I do trips and things like that, sometimes we'll do media fast or keep your phones in your pocket or turn them in or those kinds of things. But I think if that's our only solution to helping kids navigate media, we're missing it. We've got to also, at the same time as we talk about balance and, and fasting and giving up these things from time to time, I think we also need to teach them how to use it redemptively. You know, this, this is just a tool. It's not good or bad. It's how we use it. Media is the same way. And if we just run away and tell our kids to never engage that, we miss an opportunity to step into their world and help them to navigate how those things can be used for good and how to make right choices with their media and those sorts of things. So it's critical and it's where our students live. So I think it's critical to recognize that um, pictures and video and those kinds of things are, are really critical. If you've never tried this, let me give you one little practical suggestion in teaching that I found with my students to be um, an awesome, awesome, awesome teaching method. And it's one of those things that you can keep in your back pocket, so to speak. And if you come up on that week where you didn't have time to prepare or you're in between curriculum pieces and you don't know what you're going to do for a week or you're on a retreat and you just need kind of an activity that creates some connection and gets your students talking, here's one of my favorites. Um, jump on Google or something and, and just pull down some pictures. Just do an image search or maybe you even have just some stock images, but pull some images of um, people in the park, people doing all kinds of activities, um, have these pictures around and ask your students to go around and look at these pictures and choose one that resonates with and then you just kind of fill in the blank with resonates with how you're feeling as a um, new youth group member or how you're feeling in your walk with God or how you're feeling in your connection at home and you can have the craziest pictures from you know a, a squirrel riding a pig to um, you know somebody in a pristine mountain you know experience and your kids are going to start to resonate with these pictures and what's going to happen is they're going to start to tell you the story of how this picture explains how they're feeling it's going to begin to give them words for what they're experiencing in their walk with God uh, what's going on at home how things are happening at school, their friend groups. You've, you've begun to speak their language because you're talking in pictures. And you're giving them opportunity to think creatively and look at symbolism and um, you know graphical elements and, and things that are less about the right use of words and more about how they're feeling and expressing in a creative way. So I actually have a box of just pictures that I've collected over the years, again, across the gamut and from time to time I pulled those out and it's amazing to see just doing this little exercise in different ways how different kids um, begin to use pictures to tell their story and open up. Uh, journal journaling is another way that I found with students. A lot of students, some are verbal and they want to just talk a lot but a lot of them need to process, a lot of them want to reflect and when you give them time to write things down they're more open to sharing because number one they can read it so they don't have, it doesn't have to be their jumbled thoughts just kind of, you know, um, verbalized. But they're able to think about it. They're able to write some things down. Uh, it's an important way, I think, to help students begin to communicate um, is to give them ways to communicate that they understand and that are helpful to them. So it's got to be image rich, I think. And then C, connective. Um, really kind of wraps up all that we've talked about, about relationships and uh, that it's not just about the information, but it's about connecting with them. You know, our students are connected 24 hours a day with social media and things, and that's one way to connect, but we know that the face-to-face, the, -face, the personal connections are really huge. I still try to write notes to my students from time to time, handwritten notes, um, just connecting with them, you know, in any, any possible way. But when we're teaching, sometimes it's hard to connect with one student and kind of maybe feel like we leave the rest out. But I think it just means providing opportunities to press pause on the lecture and connect at a, at a deeper level. And we talked about some of the ways to do that, to get out of the church, to spend time doing some fun things together, to just be watching for 
teachable moments in the the everyday life that we that we live. So Leonard Sweet talks about epic, experiential, participatory, image-rich, connective. I think these are real keys to connecting with students in creative ways um, to really engage them and to uh, to move past just the the lecture model, but really engaging students in learning and in discipleship. So um, we're going to kind of wrap up here and, and actually we'll be pretty close to on the original schedule. I've kind of breezed through. I, I knocked out a couple of examples and some things like that. Um, but uh, critical, foundational, I think, to understanding if we're really going to meet the needs of students, um, we, we have to spend time with them. We have to understand their world and uh, we have to understand the, the nuances of um, our students. Um, I have parents from time to time talk with me about um, how, how they connect with one of their students but not with others. And we're like that too in youth ministry, right? You have those kids that you just have a natural connection with, affinity. Um, you share some things in common. Maybe your life story mirrors theirs and, and that sort of thing. I think that's okay. I think it's okay for us to have certain students that we um, just connect with naturally, but we need to work at connecting with, with all of our kids. And um, just to kind of wrap up, a couple things that I've found is uh, we have to connect with guys and girls very differently. Um, they think differently, act differently. Um, you understand all the boundaries and things in our world that you know need to be established when we're working with um, the different genders and things. And, and nowadays in this culture, that's even... Um, kind of a whole new um, world that we're living in when we talk about genders, right? But uh, I found, for example, that I can gather a group of girls and, and chat and have a discussion and it be a really connective activity. Uh, not so much with boys. <laughs> My Sunday night small group of boys, um, if we just try to sit in a circle and do what I call kind of knee-to-knee -knee or eye-to-eye -eye discussion time, yeah, it's not happening. Um, <laughs> not happening at all. Whereas the girls will chat about anything and everything, and it's and they love it, and it's really great. With boys, I talk about kind of shoulder time. I feel like with boys need, um, and men, I think, need uh, um, activity together. And I think there's like a, a trigger or something in boys' minds that um, all of a sudden it's safe and good. They can talk when they're doing things like fishing, shooting baskets, um, out at the gun range, um, riding motorcycles. Um, it's almost like they need their minds to be in some kind of gear and they just kind of, their minds open up um, when they're doing something else. And uh, so that's that's just something that I've found working with, with teens for a long, long time. Um, so don't expect or put on all of these things on all of your students the same way. They're all learning different ways. But the key is, I think, the heart and the willingness to connect with them in creative and unique ways and involve them in your life and the life of your teaching, um, I think, are really, really key elements. So um, I just the alarm that I set originally just went off, so I know we are kind of wrapping up, and I know things have shifted back just a little bit, but I want to make sure that you have time to, to get to wherever you want to go next. Um, Appreciate your attention, and hopefully you've gotten a little nugget here and there that you can take back with you. Um, I will tell you the next session that I'm doing in here, you may have seen, I've just dubbed kind of a, um, a Q&A session, not knowing exactly how things were going to look. Um, if you would like to discuss, I'd love for you to, to give me the card if you filled out kind of your greatest struggle. Um, I've curated some questions and things, and it's really just going to be more of a discussion format in the next session in here, revolving around youth ministry. We'll look at some of these cards that you've suggested and if we can kind of answer some of your greatest struggles or greatest questions. Um, several of you have been in youth ministry a long time. I'd love to lean on you a little bit and see how you answer some of these things. But uh, kind of more of an open dialogue format for this next hour. And then back in this room in the afternoon session, I'm gonna be doing kind of a lesson on meditation. Meditation's gotten a bad rap lately. And I'm going to try to, to help us see how God's Word calls us to meditation and what that could look like. 
and it's really applicable to youth groups, but it's also applicable to uh, adult groups as well. So I'm actually going to walk you through um, an exercise in meditation that I think um, my students and other leaders that I've worked with um, have found it very, very helpful for um, just reflecting on God's Word. And it'd be something that you could do with your group, um, your youth, from time to time. So anyway, that's where we're headed in this room over the next couple of sessions. You're welcome to, to head back, but I know there's lots of other great things going on out there, and I don't want to keep you from that. I thought so. what they said was, even though we were starting 15 minutes late, you would still go full hour, okay. and then they would shorten the time between the next one to just 10 minutes to walk over, mm -hmm. right. and then lunch would start basically 10 minutes late. So I guess what I'm struggling with, I heard somebody say that, but since we got in much later than just a five-minute gap, I don't know how we're going to catch up. We were talking about starting at 9.15, we would start at 9.30. Right. And go for the hour to 10.30. Okay. And the next session would start at 10.40. So it would be 10 minutes later. Than and then they'll check, oh, they're trimming off of both sessions, not just right. cramming from the one. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that, Jim. I appreciate that. So we'll, let's just take a minute for, um, we've got uh, maybe five or 10 minutes then that we can do kind of a little bit of feedback uh, discussion to wrap up. Um, so... Any, any thoughts? I'd love to get these cards, maybe something that you wrote on your card you'd like to throw out as a, as a question for a little discussion. What are your greatest pinch points or struggles when it comes to teaching students? Thank you. Anybody? Justin, you mentioned taking students with you, like shopping, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that becomes a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Right? Yeah, I tried to steer away from the one-on-one. -on -one. Right, have to, absolutely. Yep. You know, we've just adopted the ministry safe. Sure. And so, therefore, we're stressing trying to do two adults, you know, kind of thing. But yeah. But the small church, that's a huge struggle. Could you address that just a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge struggle. So the, the ministry safe stuff suggests, and there's some... Um, some ability for churches to kind of shape that for their context and what works. What we determined, I hear the, the multiple adult things, but we kind of determined in our church that when you were in public spaces, one adult was sufficient. So it was more of if you were in a classroom or those sorts of things, the two adults. So when I say I took students with me, um, yeah, I took multiple students with me and it would be, you know, two or three kids going to the store with me or picking up multiple kids um, to, to go and work. So really incredible incredibly important for you to think about in your church setting up boundaries and things but I think we all we also have to be um, really mindful and think through because I've had a lot of churches that have come to me youth leaders and said um, in some ways our youth ministry has been wrecked because we are so small we can't get two and three youth leaders to be in every room or whatever and they have to get creative about um, how they approach that so the boundaries are really important but really thinking through how does that flesh out itself in practical ministry with students because I'll tell you this I believe that protecting them and you know being secure with our students is critically important but I, I don't think the pendulum can swing all to the other other side where we just say we're not going to engage students because we're afraid of lawsuits or we're we've got to find a way to um, minister to students in a healthy and secure way without um, without just kind of creating a an atmosphere of, <laughs> um, I don't know, uh, litigation. And um, so it, similar thing like with, um, you know, appropriate touch with students. Uh, I had a lot of students uh, at Dallas First who came and parents didn't come to church. I know that they had no <laughs> encouraging voice in their life. And just the side hug or the high fives and things like that were so critical um, to them that somebody who appreciated them was willing to you know, share life with them and wasn't just, you know, I'm worried if I give you a side hug, somebody might think something of that or whatever. So we need to be really careful about the risks and things, but I think we need to say to kids, uh, I love you, I appreciate you, um, I want the best for you, and I'm willing to to walk this journey with you. Does that make sense? So, um, okay, uh, yeah. One good thing would be uh, to pray about uh, your church starting an after-school program. Because one hour a week is not enough. And uh, an after-school program with, um, with, life le with a life lesson at the end of it that they can go home with and think about would be a wonderful thing. We, 
did an after school program. We had our junior high and high school students helping with our elementary kids, and we became partners with the school in our community. We were a couple of years, you know, the partner of the year with that with that school. A lot of neat things that can be done. Again, thinking outside of the church walls. So, um, yeah, good stuff. What else do you struggle with in teaching students? Yeah. Do you have a do you possibly have the resources that would uh, help leaders to help the students to use their technology preventively? Yeah, I think there's a, a ton of resources out there. The thing that um, I think is important to note is, uh, you know, with all the resources that that uh, the internet brings to us. We need to keep in mind, you know, filters that help us, you know, point to um, specific things. I mean, um, our publishing house, Barefoot Ministries, has things that can help point you in directions in terms of youth ministry. Um, there are all kinds of other options. You heard uh, somebody talk about the right now um, media options. Um, it's a huge library, something like ten or fifteen thousand discipleship videos. Now, again, you need to recognize that. The, the videos that are on there are from you know, multiple denominations, viewpoints, so we, we need to kind of have a, a filter, a theological lens that we kind of look through. But I've found a lot of great things uh, with right now. There's things like uh, Download Youth Ministry. Um, I love group. If I, if I was a, and, and I've said to my youth pastors and youth leaders that um, I think Group Magazine still is one of the best low-cost resources for monthly <coughs> ideas and and suggestions for youth ministry uh, in the church context. So, I mean, there's a ton. I could talk with you, um, talk with other youth leaders, find out what has worked for them and where you can find resources. Um, there's there's tons out there. Did you have something? Yeah. I, you know, you're talking about taking teens to the grocery or doing, you know, things with them. How do you how do you do that without excluding some kids? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have kids that are more outgoing than other kids. How do you how do you do that without creating a clique? Yeah. So uh, first of all, I don't know that um, cliques are bad. I don't I don't know that I think that cliques are bad. When they become exclusive, that's when I think they get unhealthy. So I think natural affinity groups. I tried to lean into that. So when I found kids that like to skateboard, you know, I tried to find a youth leader who loves skateboarding and kind of envelop them into their discipleship plan and those kinds of things. But I, I hear what you're saying. <coughs> I think finding strategic opportunities. So I had kind of a mixed bag of students. We had a few homeschool kids. We had private school kids, public school kids, you know. And so I found different times of the day that I could connect with different students along those lines. So yeah, during the day, during the week, you can't connect with public school kids very much. In Dallas, it got really hard to even get into the schools for me. Um, but that was my chance to connect with the homeschool kids that I didn't connect with as well in the big, large group setting with all the public school kids and whatnot. So you kind of find, find your spots um, you know, to connect with them in different ways. So, And again, like I said, we, we connect with different students on different levels. So I don't think, don't, um, don't beat yourself down that there are certain kids you just naturally connect with. But don't just stop there. Look for work at making connections with other students, but um, you know, really celebrate the, the the students that you can, and then surround yourself with other youth leaders that connect with different students than you do. Um, every adult is going to connect with different kids. So, my youth leader staff and and small group leaders were varied in age, in. Um, demographic and interests you know all those things are important some of my favorite youth leaders and some of the ones that connected with my students in ways I couldn't were much older than me or had very different interests so it's kind of cool all right what else do you struggle with maybe one or two more yeah what do you, what do, you do with, with if sports are taking your kids away? <laughs> well it's not just sports anymore right so um, band we're in, a, we're in a society right now where it seems like everything is all-encompassing, right? There's no, when I grew up, I played um, six different sports, and I played them all, like, you know, just one right after the other, but they lined up. Now, kids can't do that. Um, we're working with my son on soccer, and it's like, he's nine years old, and they're asking for us to, like, <laughs> place our child at the, the altar of soccer, um, <laughs> you know, for everything, or else he can't really be a part. And, man, it's a, that's a tough place to, to be. I think just helping to navigate and helping our students and families to just make decisions about 
how they're spending their time and what's priority and those kinds of things. Um, I will say this about the church. I think that by and large, um, we could trim back some of our activity and be healthier uh, in the church. I really believe that. Um, we, we need to give time and space to our students and our families to waste time together, to spend time together. And if we just are running 24-7 at the church, even these are really good things, right? But are we taking away some of what I think are God-ordained family moments and family time? So um, I tried to be really intentional with my youth ministry calendar, working with our children's ministry and adult leaders, uh, to really say, what are the few things that we're going to do well, rather than just the whole smattering of all kinds of different things? And I think that served our people well, and I think it modeled for our students that um, they need Sabbath, they need family time, they need youth group time. You know, all of those things are important, not just any one thing. We get really unhealthy if we're just focusing on one. So. And you can take a group of students to go see the person yeah. play the ball game. Mm-hmm. Yep. Foster that, yeah, connection. Absolutely. I think that's good. All right, well, I hear people starting to mill about a little bit. Thank you for coming. Feel free to stick around for the discussion or come back for the lesson and meditation later on the Word. All right, thank you.